the presentation itself. Um, we have uh, two parts today. The first one, I'm going to introduce the Smart Agriculture 2063. And in the second part, uh, I will speak a little bit about the uh, dual studies concept for Malawi. And uh, what we are going to 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 achieve uh, in the uh, in the future. So, what is the problem? Africa, by end of 2022, the current number is around 1. Uh, 1,390 million people, Pan Africa, all in Africa. The population is going to double every 20 years. So you can expect to have approximately 3 billion people by the year 2040, 2045. This is not stoppable in the moment. That is the, the prognosis because many of the people are born or that people are going to have children. So there is the projection which is quite likely and it won't be, won't be stopped. So that's um, a prognosis that we do. Uh, the prognosis that you see here in this presentation already is a little bit very, very optimistic. Um, effectively, uh, uh, the curve is currently a little bit steeper, so more people are coming into Africa. But that is now the question uh, when you hear many people say, OK, high population is a problem. Yes, it's a problem because you have to feed them and many people cause more problems. But in the end, many young people are an opportunity. An opportunity for the future. And. Because many people will also be a market. Many people will be able to produce many people will are able to consume, but that is how economy is really working. So if we find solutions to get all these people that are coming in the future involved into the future, then that will be a good uh, way forward for Africa. For me, I keep saying for also nearly 10 years now, Africa, that is the continent of the future because of these many, many young people that are coming. Um, when we look at the numbers also, we know that 58% of the population currently there are under 24 years. 24 years, that's the age when you usually lo uh, leave uh, college, when you got a final uh, education finished. And 18% uh, of them uh, are currently in education and the rest is probably still in school and they are coming. So we calculate 60 million students every year and we need to get these students uh, some good uh, uh, education done. A growing population needs jobs, and they need food. How can we produce food? Yes. We, of course, we can import it and look at others who bring us the food, but that's not what I want. We don't want to look for donations for Africa. Africa can stand on its own feet and you can produce your own feed. The problem is that currently the means in agriculture is uh, not as industrialized as you have it in the global north. So we have to close the game, but we have to be more efficient to fulfill the demand that is coming from the rising population. How can I be more efficient? Well, I can be more efficient when I have well-trained, well-educated people. So we are back to the problem or back to the, to the classical topic. Future means education. So we need to train the people. The question is how we need to train the people. We have to train them in education. We have uh, in innovation. We have to train them in innovation to be engineers, to be creative people, people who invent something that is needed locally, not consumers. That is not what we need. We need 
innovators. And once we have enough innovators, we have innovation and innovation is what creates the jobs. So we have the cycle finished from the many people we need to feed because we need to feed them. We industrialize the agriculture and when we industrialize the agriculture, we have ways to give people more jobs because this industry will need many people to do something. Just imagine if you want to build a, a small robot that helps you cutting some plants or plugging some fruit. For this, you need um, uh, engineers who build the mechanics. You need engineers who make the electronics. You need engineers who make the software for the robot. We call this block altogether mechatronics because it's mechanical and electronics combined. But we, to nowadays, we need also software engineers who understand big data, who understand IoT, who understand artificial intelligence. Because the next generation of robots will be driven by something what we call nowadays artificial intelligence. Just think of this big hype that is currently going on with the chat GPT. Well, it's a big hype because if you look at the technology behind, you will see that's not that um, uh, uh, dramatic and not that innovative as it looks like, but at least it draws attention. So to repeat, the needs of coming decades is that the growing population needs education and work, we need alimentation, so feeding of the people, that means agriculture, but it means also along with agriculture to protect nature and wildlife. And we need to protect the environment, so we have to integrate the environment in our future development, not just take and uh, take the, the trees out as it happened in a subtle zone uh, in the 1970s and in the end we get deserts. Now we have to look very much into the future. Um, startup is what we need. Startups are entrepreneurs, young people who have ideas and who have a feeling how they can take their innovation into the market. But in order to allow startups to be successful, they need, of course, some kind of money, they need of mentoring. And so what they need is uh, incubators and they need other startups to collaborate. So we need innovation centers for sure that they all can collaborate and can incubate their ideas. And if we have innovation centers and the, such an innovation centers, our two universities, Luanar and Unilia, are already uh, ready to be innovation centers. And once we have ideas and innovations there, we can invite investors, professional investors, to give the seed funding to help producing it. Funding, investment, not donations. So don't look for money. Oh, I have an idea. Give me money. I will do something. No, an investor will ask you in the end, show me the plan, what you are going to do and how can I get my money back? Not tomorrow, but maybe in 20 years. But he will ask for how to get a return of investment. So we think of investment. We don't think of donations. And to make this all happen, we need the governments. The governments need to prepare the political field, the laws that are needed, and they have to guide the people to work together in harmony. That is like a director of an orchestra. You can play orchestra. Every musician is a perfect player, but uh, in order to be uh, uh, have a good concert, you need to have a director who keeps them all in sync, all play in tune together. And that is what the government needs to be. The government needs to give the right guidance. Uh, government needs also to subsidize uh, research and expertise on upcoming trends, because they are the ones who should have also the international relationships and getting on. And 
the government needs to assist in evaluating investment proposals because the government has the connections to those who bring the big money into the markets. Anyway, the future is education in digital topics. You know, you're all young people, and uh, I guess none of you wants really to work on a field. Take your hands, uh, dig the soil with your hands and, 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 and seed something and wait until uh, uh, the, the plant is growing. When we were young, it was the same thing. We didn't want to work on the fields, although they asked, uh, parents asked, hey, you can go on the field, you can work with your own hands. Said, no, we don't want it, we want to be engineers. But once you gave us a tractor and everybody was happy to run, uh, to ride a tractor over the fields, then we were riding a tractor and then we, everybody was happy to work on the field as well. And now the future will go a little bit in the same way. We want to do educate the people in engineers and then they can invent machines like drones, like robots, like any kind of other machines, mini tractors, whatever innovation will come. And then the engineers can use their machines to do the, uh, the field work, uh, the agricultural work, while uh, they themselves are engineers and work as engineers and can do also other many, many good things. There is a word for this future technology. That is what we call Industries 4.0. It stands allegedly for the next industrial revolution. It's an industrial revolution, but um, whether it's the fourth or the fifth or the third or whatever, that's uh, it's just for for the feuilleton, for the newspapers to make nice discussions. The fact is that when we speak about Industries 4.0, we mean that we are using now the modern computer technology, including artificial intelligence, to build any kind of industrial product, be it a robot, be it a car, but Industries 4.0 will also be in the smart cities, in the cognitive cities. It will also be uh, in the... Um, uh, used in, in tourism, for example. Uh, so uh, tourism is uh, also now tourism 4.0. Uh, before you travel to uh, to to make a safari, you probably look go to a computer game and you integrate also your safari proposals into computer games to so make the people more interested in coming on site. And uh, so when the people come to Malawi and will come to the lake, they know already much about the lake before even having been there, and then they deep dive into the real world. For agriculture. We call it agriculture 4.0, then consequently uh, we need technology for improving it. We need the technology to protect the environment. We need the technology for the smart mobility also. So we don't want to do extra transport. So we want to transport the, um, the, the fruit that you have harvested. Uh, we want to transport it just in time on the shortest and the most optimized way uh, to the markets so that we are not spending money in transportation, wasting food because it took too long. And uh, we will also need uh, technology for sustainable tourism, not only for, for, for interactive tourism, but also sustainable tourism. That only works if we have the right technology. The next cities are smart cities, or as we call it, cognitive cities. So the cities um, will be full with uh, technology everywhere. You will have internet, even in the small villages. You will have an internet connection, and uh, if you need um, uh, maybe a taxi, you just tell you want a taxi, and ten people more want a taxi from the same place, and the taxi company will send probably a bus and say hey, ten people from place from Lilongwe want to go uh, at four o'clock to to Muzuzu. And then sending a bus instead of sending ten individual cars, and that also helps protecting the environment. 
Um, we need technology for smart energy. I hear that, uh, or I just saw now also in the chats, uh, the big problem in, in, in Malawi is still that the power supply is unstable. So many of you might have been connected now with the mobile phone only because there was no power to connect with the, with the, with the, with the real uh, desktop PC on this one. So uh, technology can help to stabilize the energy uh, to, to control the reliability of energy. And we will use technology very much in education and in sciences. That's a self-fulfilling thing a little bit uh, because we are um, develop technology and we use technology to develop technology. Sounds somehow logical and natural. Often it's forgotten. Often the people develop technology and they use paper to design it. But there's other ways of doing it. Uh, if you want to have a role model, you look at India. India is now the number one in the world when it comes to computer sciences. They are the leader in computer technologies. And most development in artificial intelligence comes directly or indirectly from India. Even if you look at Silicon Valley and say, oh, inventation comes from, uh, the in, uh, innovation comes from Silicon Valley, from California. Then you have to go there and then you see what people are sitting there. And then you know that of more than half of the people there are coming from the Indian subcontinent. So. <laughs> India has its influence, India has taken this role, and Africa can do the same by finding its own niche. I'm always speaking about artificial intelligence. Now, everybody talks about artificial intelligence. As I mentioned already, ChatGPT, everybody talks about it. It's a big hype uh, that this robot, you talk with him and or you give him an order and he will uh, write uh, an essay or he will write your homework uh, completely just by giving them some keywords. Uh, yeah, that's possible. That's possible because artificial intelligence is based on big data and now the algorithms behind are not so complicated behind ChatGPT, but there is a lot of data. And uh, this data is what makes ChatGPT so stunning, also surprising on the first glance. Although the technology behind is by far not that smart and intelligent as it might appear to us. But artificial intelligence anyway, you have it everywhere, search engines. Search engine, you search something and they make an intelligent search for you. And if you're searching 10 times the same things, they are the, the search engine like Google tries even to improve your search by because it learned already what you are interested in or what you're looking for. Or that you maybe have denied a couple of times the proposals they made. So the next time it will propose something differently. Navigation systems, they are smarter. If you go Google Google Maps and, 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 and ask for uh, how to go from A to B, from Nozuzu to, to Lilongwe, it will find the shortest and the best way in the uh, of the moment. So if there is a, a problem with the road uh, that you usually would take, it will give you a deviation and say, you have to take a different road because this road is blocked for whatever reason. Smartphones are full of uh, technology, uh, artificial intelligence. They can recognize your face. They can recognize your voice today. So, um, and uh, a lot of uh, platform economies like Uber, they use a lot of artificial intelligence. They try to find out the best way, the cheapest way to go from A to B, but they also uh, try to target you with marketing that next time it's, they are sure that you are coming back to Uber and not going to a competition. Amazon, they have intelligent ways of pl uh, placing their advertisement. Think of Alexa also. You, you talk with Alexa, as, which is also a form of a chat GPT. And uh, it's called robot process automation. Uh, automation huh? so, so you have artificial intelligence everywhere. And you will have it also in agriculture. But basically artificial intelligence is nothing else to use the power of a machine to do things faster and better because the computer has access to so many data at the same time while you can only ask your grandfather and grandmother what would be the best plant to plant next year 
the artificial intelligence algorithms, they can now uh, millions of other farmers or databases that the farmers have left behind as a spur. They can use it and uh, derive uh, decisions on there. But basically artificial intelligence is still a tool for the human brain. Like a plow was it for the farmers. And that's a bridge. The plow was innovation. It was a big breakthrough in industry. That was the first industrial revolution. Artificial intelligence is the next step forward. If you use it again in artificial intelligence, we have the right way for doing it. So industries 4.0 is innovation. I hope I made it clear with my speaking before. Um, Industries 4.0 is basically to make use of artificial intelligence to process all this big data that has been collected now by this modern Internet of Things devices. And if you invest in Industries 4.0 technology education, then this is the opportunity for Africa's nations to become a leading player in the world like India is already. And if you look at the history of India 20 years before, India was still very, very behind, or at least seen as being behind. And in only 20 years, they became the big, big players. Same thing happened in the Middle East. If you look at Dubai, uh, I remember Dubai in the 1990s, then it was um, just a small Arabian village. There was nothing. There was no skyscrapers. There were no metro. There was hardly any traffic on the roads. 30 years later, this is the investment capital of the world. So. There is an opportunity to achieve all this in the next 40 years to fulfill the agenda 2063, Africa 2063, and our project is targeting to go there. Industries 4.0 is suitable for Africa. Industries 4.0 can make African nations autonomous, to make them less dependent from the global north as they are today because Africa's uh, current poverty has a lot to do that most money goes back to the global north instead of investing into their own countries, just because they have to buy things to survive. And that's the gap that we have to close, and that is where we can do things much better. But Industries 4.0 will be also the place where you can have startups, you will have solutions for your own country, for your own regions. But if you have a good solution, you can sell it to the world market, and then you're part of the big players. And it's definitely a chance to come out of the poverty. I have here a small overview of jobs that are needed to do industries 4.0 or to do, do agriculture 4.0, to do artificial intelligence, however you want to call it. You need telecommunication engineers, the one who build the internet connections from A to B. You need networking engineers who build, who, who take the, the wires or build the, the wireless uh, hubs somewhere. You need the mechatronics, which I mentioned before, mechanicals plus electronics. You need people who understand the Internet of Things. You need cybersecurity specialists. You need uh, blockchain is now also very much in demand. You need designers who are creative. You need people who market the things in the cyberspace. You need big data analysts. You need communication specialists and, 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 and. You need so many people. Um, needed to uh, to just to build a small robot. All these kind of jobs are needed. And if I want to build a lot of technology, I have jobs for so many people all of the time. Here are applications for artificial intelligence, smart cognitive cities. I mentioned already we use uh, artificial intelligence in mobility and transportation. That is where the engineers are needed. The engineers are needed also for build up the cyber tourism. Engineers are needed to create interactive learning. We are going to do something what is called flipped classroom in future. First we learn in the internet, then you go to the college and discuss with your mentors how to improve and, and when you have questions. So learning in the university will not be sitting there and listening what the professor says. 
when you come to the university, you will do what I did when I was at university. When I came to the universities, most students were smarter than the professors because we were already working with the next generation technology. But we still needed a professor to learn methodology. We needed a professor to discuss and to find out what of our bright ideas could be uh, could survive in the future. But you will do the same. You will do interactive learning with a computer. There you learn the basic skills, but then you go to the college and you discuss and make something real good out of out of the learning. Then agriculture 4.0, here we are back. We will use all this artificial intelligence to invent great, great things uh, for the agriculture, because that will be the main application that will by far the biggest need and the biggest application there, along with the healthcare. I didn't mention the healthcare. Healthcare is another topic that we definitely have to have to uh, come on there. Oh, here on the left, you can see uh, a modern tractor in Germany. This is a computer lab. It looks like the cockpit of a Boeing uh, 747. And we use drones, of course, we use small robots. The drones are not the most uh, important ones, but you definitely use all this high tech already when you go onto a field in Germany or go onto a, onto a field in, 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 uh, in America or in Australia. So instead of doing all these manual works, you will have robots who can do mass planting, mass seeding, and mass harvesting. The, uh, the harvesters that you can see here, they're all autonomous. They are not, uh, there's not three drivers sitting in there. There is practically no driver in any of them. And the, the driver is sitting somewhere next to the field with a remote control and is just supervising, monitoring what these harvesters are doing. That's an innovation which is now for the big markets. For Africa, we need probably something else, something like uh, Fent was uh, already uh, proposing. You see uh, small robots, these robots are like a toy but they can go on the fields and they can do uh, all the seeding, the drilling and the harvesting. And uh, when they are done, they go back to a big pot and then the, um, and, 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 and they take the car and they can drive away with all these small little robots. These are things that already exist, so I don't want you to rebuild, I want you to innovate, but that will give you the ideas where the future can go. So, the idea behind our Agriculture 2063, Agriculture 4.0 concept is that we want the young people to learn technology. They need to understand what their own people, their own neighbors need in the farm work. They can build robots that are good for the Africa, not good for the big fields in Australia, New Zealand, uh, North America. They need robots that might be for the small farms, for the small family farms in Africa. We need to have robots that, of course, do precision farming so that the yield that we get out of the fields is very, very uh, attractive. We need young people who can program the robots. As old people, we are not able, we are not smart enough. This is like if you're a football player, um, you can play until a certain age, but then you are not fast enough. So the young people are the ones who can program robots. And we need young computer specialists with their brain to invent solutions. So when I say we need the young people, actually, you are the young people. I'm talking to the young people now. So you are the ones, you are the future. You are the ones who do the artificial intelligence and uh, solutions. And in the end, we get a big, sufficient, uh, and efficient, not sufficient, efficient, sustainable farming. Young people, digitalization, and climate, these challenges all together will bring us to great solutions for Africa. 
So that was my a little bit of an introduction on Agriculture 4.0 and the Agriculture 2063 that we are planning. So we want to get technology, we want to educate you with technology, and we want you to be inventive. But now, of course, this is a lot of theory, and we thought actually, well, theoretical concept is nice, but we need to get you something very practical. And in order to get practical, we come back to the way how education is done in Europe. We call it the German education methodology, dual studies. This concept of dual studies exists for centuries in Europe. And it means that you are not like you might be used to first go to a college and a university, learn the theory, and once you have made your examination, you find a job. Now you will get a project and you will work on the project. And while you work on the project, you will learn also the theory and the basis. The reason is that you will understand immediately why you learn certain mathematics. So uh, you might feel this, uh, you go to your lesson for mathematics and you learn that you have to calculate how, uh, what the acceleration of your car is and the first and the second deviation of uh, some curve. And you say, oh, this is very theoretical and you don't understand really why you will ever need it. But if I bring you and say, I have 10 robots who are autonomously working, then uh, the have to have some algorithms that these robots are not colliding. So if you have 10 robots who are running on the field, it is not self-understanding. It's not very natural that they are not just running and then bumping each other. That's no good. In order to avoid that they're bumping in each other, you have to have some algorithms that control the speed so that you can anticipate already if I move with this speed, then I will collide with this robot. If I reduce my speed a little bit or I accelerate a little bit my speed, then I will be at the position when the other robot is crossing, um, I will already pass this point. So this is pure mathematics, pure physics. And when you work on the robot, you will immediately understand why you need this mathematics, why you need this physics. And that will go with many, many things that you learn that you see. Here is what you, uh, what all this theory is about. Um, the concept is now built that we want to give you a project. A project that you students execute completely from the idea to the design. You will make cal calculations for the investment. You will have to calculate how much money it will cost. You also have to, to find out where you can get the money from. Yeah, then you, you have to ask then other industries. You have to ask uh, all the sources that might have money and see if you can convince them. But that is something you would have to do also when you have a real job in a, in, in, in a real enterprise. That is what the, your boss is asking you. So you have to go and uh, you have to understand uh, how investment works. You have to, you will learn how investment works and you will convince other people to give you the right investment, the right money to implement something. Once you have done this calculation and you got your seed investment, you will be able to do uh, the implementation in form of a prototype first. If the prototype is convincing, you go to some market, you go to some trade fairs, you go to some places where you can show your product, where you can really show up and say, listen, what I have built, this is the great part, a great piece of uh, machines that I did here. And when you see that the people are interested, it, then you can go to the market and you can sell it. And if you are bold enough, you can create a startup and then the startup can grow and can grow and can become a big company. And there is no reason why this big company could not originate from Malawi. It is not about where you come from. It is about how good your idea is and how good your idea will suit to the market and how good it will fulfill the needs and the demands of the market.
The benefits are relatively clear. Students learn while they do the real work. So you will work on a project and you learn while you do the project and you will understand immediately why you have to learn certain things. You will create solutions for their own country. This is probably the most important part because you will provide solutions that are good for the villages in Malawi and not something that was good for North America and good for Australia, but then they sell you for a lot of money the machines to, uh, to Malawi and say, OK, but this tractor is not working in the mountain areas of Malawi because it was never meant for this kind of uh, territory and it was never meant to work in uh, for this kind of fruits and plants that you have. And whatever you have done during these dual studies, you have a practical education, you have done your apprenticeship, you will already be a sort of a real bachelor, somebody who can get a job immediately because you have done a job before while you did your university. And for Malawi as a society and also for the neighboring countries, uh, when you speak of Malawi, we can easily roll it out to Zambia, to Tanzania, to uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Mozambique. So we have a lot of uh, opportunities to roll it out, but it is a fast and an affordable track for industrialization. Why it's affordable? Normally, if you have a project, you look for money and then you set up everything from the basics, but your university has it already and your university will spend money on educating you. When you spend your time in education by producing something that in the end can be marketed, can be sold, then there is a big win-win for you, for the market, for Malawi and also for the universities. Um, just an example, something that we are already have defined as uh, one of the uh, lighthouse projects that we want to do. We want to look at one of the biggest assets of Malawi, that's the Lake Malawi. When I was uh, started talking with uh, with with Malawi, uh, it's nearly a year now, but uh, I I was a bit surprised that uh, Malawi had. Uh, Originally, a lot of tobacco, a lot of uh, kind of uh, second line uh, fruits that were normally exported. But the biggest asset of Malawi is for me the lake. And I think everybody can agree that the lake is the biggest asset in, in Malawi. But taking the fish and the fish food out there is uh, currently also a problem. Um, the Lake Malawi is full of fish, yes, but uh, in order to, to make this fish usable and, and, and fish, I mean, in, in the necessary quantity, you have to feed them. But in order to feed them, you have currently to import the fish food. So we have to find ways how we can grow the fish food locally. So a project would look like, that's an example, the real project is defined much more complex, but for the sake of this presentation, I stripped it down to the basics. Students will analyze the existing situation, so you will find out what kind of food is already existing in Malawi, what food needs to be imported, what workforces are needed to, to produce it yourself, what education might be needed. You have to educate the farmers if they have to change the fruits. You have to also calculate if the market is really powerful enough that in the end, it is not a loss, it will be a win. And you will have to define in the beginning also the financial needs, at least roughly. In the phase two, you students will implement a prototype. So we will define a small area where you do some fruits and, uh, and you will see how this could impact the, fish, the fishery uh, with the fish food that you produce. And in parallel, and here we are going into the world of the internet, in the world of globalization. All of a sudden you can build something here in Malawi, an internet platform for the fish farming, for the special situation or for the fish food production for fish farming. And then you're in something what is called the blue economy. Blue economy is one of the big, big uh, 
elements uh, in the world. Uh, white's blue, blue stands for water. So economy that is related to the water. We speak about green economy, that's all about sustainability. Uh, we speak also about orange economy, that is about creativity, uh, all these artworks and all, and, and, and the tailors and the designers who make nice clothes, and they're there in the orange economy. And the blue economy is one of the big ones. It is about the lakes, it's about the fisheries, about the rivers, it's about the oceans. Oceans uh, who need to be cleaned, but they also they need to, the, the fish need to be reserved in a way in this one. Um, in terms of blue economy, there is a big hype. We are currently building up an uh, innovation center in Mauritius for blue, blue economy. So that's also in a place where you first would not expect it, but in the end it's natural. Uh, Mauritius lies in the Indian Oceans, very small island, even smaller than Malawi, but they have all the possibilities to be a big leader in the blue economy. And you can play in the same league if you have some invention and contribute to the blue economy. So it can be a blue economy center point, especially for the fish food production. That's our expectations when we do this project. So once we have to find our internet platform and we have implemented the prototype, we will bring this solution to the farmers. When I say we, uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, exaggerated. Actually, you, you students, you will bring it to the farmers and you will start a market with them. And when we are good, then we will be able to prepare the sizing. That means that we hopefully are able to export some or some of the fish and the fish food to the neighboring countries, even to the global north, wherever there is a market in order to get revenues from there. So from being somebody who is taking donations from the global north, Malawi will be a player who is contributing and selling to the markets and something where Malawi is really good on. So relatively easy what we need. We need projects defined by universities, like the example project that I just uh, introduced, the fish food for Lake Malawi. We need you students from at least two universities. We have it. Luanar and Unilia together. We can be already cooperating. So this is a, a good, good, good way of doing. Why it's two universities a minimum? Actually, if it's only one, then the reach out will not be very. But if two are working together, if two are marching in line, it is like 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 a family. If a husband and wife understand each other very, very well, then they will be a good family and they will be very, very successful. If one marches alone, then it is always more problem in finding alliances and you you're solitaire then, you're a maverick then, but if two or more working together, then you will find, then this is a path to success. Industry partners to invest, that is what we need. Of course, sir, we need money to grow mainly for the seed investment as well, but seed investment can come sometimes from, from organizations like UNESCO, World Bank or, or whoever is in the game. And uh, these are organizations we are permanently asking for money, of course. Uh, and if you come with the right concept, they are also very willing in assisting us. But they also want to see that in the end there is a return of investment. And if the return is only a good education, then it's also something sufficient for UNESCO. If you bring you good education, then they're already happy with this one. And we need, in the end, uh, partner universities from the global north. So currently we're negotiating with universities in Germany, India and in France uh, in order to be partners. Um, the idea is that if you make an examination in Malawi, you can do student exchange with these universities, but your examination should also be accepted in Germany or in France or in India. So our promise is uh, well-trained graduates immediately after the study. Solutions 
that you provide are immediately there to improve the local life. The international relations for finance and trade will help very, very much for the investment that will give you an advantage to other countries or to others who are too lazy to move. It will be innovation for Africa. It will be employment for engineering for the young. We will have skilled farmers. Skilled farmers produce good produce and it will bring you more and more independence of the global north. It will be you will be a, an equal partner to anybody in the world. Sounds like a dream, but sometimes dreams are wiser than just a plan. So keep thinking you are the students and you are the change that you want to be. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you have any question, the chat room is open. If you don't have any questions, you uh, know how to reach us all. Just send emails, send messages, contact your, your seniors here. They will also connect, although a lot of the people I see here in this line are already connected anyway uh, through our Agriculture 2063 group. And if you want to join the group and are not yet part of it, just ask uh, Patrick, Harry, uh, Christopher um, uh, or Rebecca uh, to uh, add you to the to our WhatsApp group. Then you are immediately part of the news. Thank you very much. Um, um, I'm at the end of my speech. So, are there any questions coming in there? I have to look now. Uh, while I do presentation, I cannot look at the jet. I will see if something came into the jet. No, there was no special questions now. So I will give you one or two minutes if somebody wants to type, wants to raise its hand. Timothy uh, is joining. Yeah, good day, Timothy. <laughs> Vice Chancellor, Vice Chancellor Nyasulu and Vice Chancellor Kaunda, please, uh, you. So the stage is yours. Do you want to say something? Because I can't hear anything. Oh, your microphone. OK, I see we have an issue with uh, with getting you into the voices. Let me see if I can. Activate. Allow you because you're in as a guest. Well, let me see if I. OK. So. Let me see if you can if you if you can activate your microphone now. We'll take it maybe some seconds until it's active. OK, now you would be able you can unmute yourself and you can speak. Professor Konda, I see you that you're unmuting, so let's see if you're if you're working. Well, yeah, I was I was I was leaving the, uh, for Vice Chancellor Timothy to start, but thank you very much, Axel, for the uh, good um, presentation, but also uh, to have quite good ideas. I, I think what will be very meaningful is, like we have said, how we build up our agriculture systems that is aquaculture with technology and uh, and i think uh, this is what is going to can transform because capacities uh this side as you rightly said 
are a little bit limited. We've got quite a few experts, a few young brains that are coming up, but we need to build that capacity uh, for uh, artificial intelligence as well as the ready for the industry for. So uh, also what I think is how we can uh, start our youth to start discussing these issues, uh, uh, how they can be mentored, how they can link up with uh, uh, a lot of the people out there and uh, through the various networks. But, you know, in a nutshell, I wanted just to say thank you very much. I think transformation comes in with uh, the technology and we, we are fully challenged in our agriculture sector of how we can push uh, technology to the high end to, to transform. Otherwise, Africa will remain, uh, will remain, particularly Malawi, will remain uh, backwards if we don't harness uh, this great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, for. I think we speak in the same same words. Vice Chancellor Timothy, you wanted to also to say something? Hello. Hello. Are you hearing me now? Yes, we hear you. Ah, ah fine, thanks. Yeah, in fact, what, what I wanted to say actually is what Professor Kaunda has already mentioned saying that the strength of this project is that we so much uh, rely on the, the youth uh, who are so good in technology and they and they, um, they just need to be strongly supported and encouraged as early as, as now so that um, as we are looking to uh, get to 2063 uh, some of us by that time we may not be as as we are now so uh, the approach that we would want to empower the youth on this program i i, I feel it's 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 a great opportunity as, as professor kaunda said so I'm, I'm simply saying your presentation is just touching the uh, real issues that we need to deal with if we want to move forward i just wanted to say that Thank you very much. Uh, it's it's that's the.